today's scripture is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. John 17, verse 14 to 18. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that they thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this past week. Thank you, Lord, as we begin to see the seasons change. Father, let us be alert to the seasons, Lord, the spiritual seasons, Lord, of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as we are aware of the seasons on this earth. We know that Jesus is coming soon. Let us all live to be ready for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may meet, with, meet him in the clouds, Lord, with joy amongst the brethren, Lord, who also are waiting for his return. And Father, we thank you, Lord, and let us have a serious faith in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one coming unto you except by him. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that we have eternal life. I thank you for the blood that Jesus shed, that we may have our sins cleansed, we may be forgiven of our, all of our sins, so we can start afresh every day, anew. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are God who loves us, a God who is merciful, a God who is full of grace, and above all, you are love. For the Bible says God is love. And Father, I thank you, Lord, God Almighty, that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, that we may have eternal life. We may spend eternity with you. And Father, I pray that you be with each and every one of us as we take one day at a time. One day at a time, Lord, that we may glorify you with our, with our lives, Lord, the things that we say, how we live this life. And Father, we know, Lord, that there are other people that are going through difficult times, and some, Lord, who are sick, and we continue to lift up those who are ill, who have these stricken with diseases, Lord, and, and by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we pray in agreement for the healing for Brother Richard. Thank you, Lord, for Sister Emilita. And Father, for Deacon Charles, we thank you for the good report. Pray your complete healing as well. Dr. Kim Chun Won, thank you, Lord. Brother Choron, continue to encourage him. Brother Tom's mother as well, David Chondasanim. Sister Victoria, Gary Maeda, Sister Pick, Esther Samanim's mother, one me, someone him's father, Sister Rachel and Sister Rachel's father as well. Pray also, Lord, for healing touch for Sister Arlene's sister and nephew, for Brother Jesse's complete recovery. Pray for comfort for Deacons Furlan and Cynthia Cossing over the passing away, the sudden passing away of his sister. May you comfort the entire family as well, Lord. Father, comfort for Brother Bobby McKnight um, over the passing away of his uncle as well. And Father, we pray that you encourage them and all others, Lord, that need your healing. May they know by the stripes of Jesus they may receive their healing through faith. We pray for peace in Jerusalem. Pray for peace on the Korean Peninsula as well. Peace in Nigeria South Sudan, Kenya, the Republic of the Philippines, and the United States of America. 
Father, pray for wisdom and protection for the par presidents, for the prime ministers, the leadership of each country, and protection as well for their families. Father, we lift up unto you. We go to you, for you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And we do pray, Lord, for 100% gainful full-time employment for every member in VCF, in all of our VCF family. And Father, we pray, Lord, that there'll be 100% faithful service of all the VCF members here in the VCF ministries. May they know that they serve you, Lord, and they please you, Lord. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and ask for your grace. We do welcome the presence of your Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory to shine here, filling our hearts that we would be able to receive and be receptive to receive all that you have for us here today. We ask that your angels surround this meeting, this gathering, this fellowship, and protect it against demonic attacks or interferences or disturbances. Let us freely receive all that you have for us. And we thank you, Lord, for each one here and the families that are represented as well. And I ask that you anoint me with your Holy Spirit, that the word shall go forth with power, dividing asunder between spirit and soul, that we may all receive and be changed and transformed, our minds renewed. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I give the Lord a praise clap, for God is good and all the time. Okay, look at someone and say, I love you with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be friendly this morning. The Lord shall keep you from evil. And what I want to share with you this morning is God is spirit. God is a spirit, and he works in spiritual ways. He works in supernatural ways. Too often, we will um, we would reduce our lives to, a, to just a natural phenomena, and we limit that we limit God, but God is spirit. You must always remember, and we as born again Christians are spirit, soul, and body. So there is that body, there's that natural part of us, the natural phenomena, but there's also a spirit man, there's a spiritual world. And Isaiah, if you look in chapter six, you don't have to go there, but just write it down, was taken into the spirit and he saw the throne. He saw sitting on the throne the Lord, and his eyes opened up to the things of the Spirit. Isaiah was a prophet of God. He was one who had heard the word of God, and he would, he would speak that to the, to the kings. And um, many times, if not most of the time, he would get um, pretty negative um, reactions from the kings and uh, Jeremiah and, and many of these prophets. You know, a lot of times we look at prophets as someone that's going to encourage, exhort, and they do that. Prophets do give you encouragement, but if you read Isaiah and Jeremiah, um, they, they had to have some kind of um, experience with, uh, with, with God to keep on going because humans, we don't like to get rejected. We don't like people saying negative things about us. We don't like people saying or disagreeing with us, you know. So they had to have this spiritual experience, and, and Isaiah did, taking up in the spirit. Apost the Apostle John as well, uh, when he wrote the, the book of Revelation, um, he was taken into the spirit. He saw heaven. He saw the things of the spirit. If we, 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 we sang, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, right? You know what that meant? Is that you're asking God, you are asking God to open up your spirit eyes, to see the things of the Spirit. That's what you're saying. Open the eyes. Not, it's not just a lovely song, beautiful song that we can sing and, and all that. It's, you're asking God, uh, this is taken from Ephesians um, uh, chapter 1, basically. I don't know, 18 or 19, verse 18 or 19, someplace in there, where Paul is praying that the eyes of understanding will be open, be enlightened. And I pray that every morning for you, whether you believe it or not, 
that your eyes will be, your spiritual eyes will be enlightened. Because when you walk in the natural, which are only your, your natural eyes, you are walking limited, okay? Um, in a limited capacity. But as children of God, if you're born again, you're born of the Spirit, then you have the capacity for spiritual eyes. And a lot of people will say, ah, oh, this is all fantasy and all that. But no, this is the truth. Because we are spirit as well as we are natural and physical. So I want to take you this morning through uh, the scriptures so you would understand that there is a spirit world as well. Okay? So the things you're going to hear, don't just dismiss it as, oh, this is just something and what we're going to eat for lunch. Okay? So we need to go beyond that and realize that there is truly a spirit world, a spiritual world, and you can walk in this spiritual uh, uh, life as well. When you do that, then you have the full spectrum um, of how we ought to be living this life. Jesus would look to the Father, right? And during the times of, of sadness, distress, isolation, when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he had no one. His, his, his apostles, he told them to wait and, and to tarry to pray, to pray for him. And all of them, but the, 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 the food and all that, and you guys all understand because you all took uh, human anatomy courses. Uh, when you eat the food and, and uh, all the, the food goes on there and, and then you get sleepy and all that, well, it, the, the tiredness took over for the apostles and Jesus is praying and he's sweating like drops of blood. And he's, he's hoping that his buddy is there, the 12, 11 disciples now, because Judas uh, committed suicide. 11, uh, well, he didn't commit suicide, but he betrayed him. Um, the 11 were going to pray for him. Just like I know you're praying for a pastor and some of them every morning. Amen? Hallelujah. I know that. See, the ones who responded quick. The ones who had to think are like, did I pray for pastor this morning again? Because the pastor is praying for you. Amen? One, and you guys are a hundred, right? One. One. We're only one, right? Someone and myself. So pray for us. Amen? So Jesus prays for an hour. He comes out of the garden of Gethsemane. And Peter, James, and John, the three uh, loyal, closest to, you know, we give them a lot of credit, right? The closest to Jesus. The heart was good, right? The, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Look at someone and smile. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, so sometimes you're going to need that, okay? You're going to, not know sometimes, but if, if every day, if your life can be dependent upon the Lord and you look to him, you're going to see that really we don't need the, 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 the connections with human connections and all these people that we so depend upon or the system that you trust in, that can all fail you, but God will never fail you. I'm here to point you through to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will never fail you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Man can, be, can show up late. Man can, can fail you miserably. But Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ will never, ever fail you. Isn't that something encouraging? Amen? Okay. So, the Lord shall keep you from evil. And when we say shall, we were talking about this in a Bible study. Shall is like a promise, okay? It's like he will do it. It's not a matter of, uh, I wonder if God's going to do this or not. So, if you can fix in your mind that the Lord shall keep you from evil, it's him saying, I'm going to do this for you. I will keep you from evil. And evil, we know, originates from the devil. He has his demons, but in most cases, in most of our cases, we are not going to be visited by Satan. Satan is one spirit, right? Right? one person. He cannot be a million places at once. 
So a lot of times you say, oh, the devil is attacking me. No, the devil is not attacking you. Unless you're doing something where you're, you're taking down the kingdom of, of darkness, you're sharing the gospel, the devil is not coming against you. So don't worry about that. Demons comprise of one-third of the angel population, okay? I've, I've tried to do the multiplication and all that, but I've, I've not come down to how many angels there are in heaven yet. So because I don't know how many angels in heaven, I don't know what one-third is. Do you understand? Okay, so there, but, so there are many angels, millions and millions and millions and billions, I don't know, but one third of those were uh, rebelled along with Lucifer, Satan, to attack uh, Michael, uh, the archangel, and then, but they were kicked out of heaven, right? But um, so Satan has limited amount of demons or evil spirits. And unless, again, you are uh, going to be used by the devil or, or attacking his kingdom, you're probably not going to be visited by demons. Okay, most of you are not going to be because if you just continue to live your life and be a nice person and all that, you're no threat to, to Satan and his, to his forces. So m most of the time, the things that happen is because of our flesh or because of evil people. But regardless, evil originates from Satan, from the devil, okay? And then um, there are evil spirits and there's also evil people who do evil things, all right? So that when we say evil, it's, it, it comprises of all of that, okay? That's what evil is, all right? So I gave you the, the preface. I gave you the introduction. So let, let's go into the scriptures where Jesus is saying he's praying for his disciples. He's not praying that God the Father take them out of the world, because we are all in the world, okay? We are all in the world, but he's not saying to take us out of the world. He's just saying to keep us from evil because evil is all around us every single day of our lives. So if you read about Christians that try to buy a property out in the country land and build their own Christian community, that's not what the Bible is saying. We need to stay in the world, but not be of the world. Okay? You understand? Why do we need to stay in the world? It's because light is in us. Light needs to share with darkness. So we need to be in the world so we can share the, the gospel with the people in darkness. It is not... God's will that we go up in a mountain and we live in one uh, Christian community all by ourselves. No, that's not his will. There will be heaven but that's at the end, okay? In the meanwhile while we are in this world, we are here to share his, the gospel, to bring light into the world. So Jesus is not praying that we be taken out of the world. Otherwise the moment we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we should die. Right? So we can go straight to heaven. The reason why you're alive here, whether you know it or not, is, is not so that you can work, make, make a living, and then uh, take care of your family and all that. That's not the n number one purpose. It's so that you can propagate the gospel. You can share the gospel. So if you're not doing that, then you're not utilizing God's grace and God's time. Many people are going to get diverted we, we, we just focus on our work. We focus on making money. We focus on doing all that. But we're not doing what, uh, what God wants us to do, the, the top priority, which is to share the light in the darkness. That's why we're kept in this world. Otherwise, we should just go. We should just go and, and, and be in heaven. So I suppose, I suspect many of us have our priorities Mismatch. Okay, we need to get the priorities correct, and 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 know why you're still alive here today. By God's grace, you woke up this morning. Amen. We take that for granted. 
oh, because I took my vitamins and, and, and I did my exercise. No, there are people that have been marathon, um, marathon runners. They run like 80 miles a, a week. They die suddenly, okay, at their prime. How? Well, I don't know. But so even though you take care of your health, take all these vitamins and medicine and all that, and um, your life on earth is, is, is by God's grace. So once you realize that, then you can appreciate every single day of your life. Amen? All right. So we are in the world as believers, children of the light, but we are not of the world. Okay, I have to go slowly with this because we have to understand um, the spirit world and then the purpose that we are here for. Okay, so God is going to keep you from evil. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the Christians in Thessalonica, and they have, have been going through persecutions, troubles, and these are people that are going after them. It's something that um, you're minding your own business, right, and you, you're, um, you're doing your own thing. You're not bothering anything, anyone, but then they have these people, instigators, that, co that are coming against them. So some of us might be in that situation as we follow the Lord that we find out that, wow, people just don't like us for some reason. Not, we didn't do anything wrong. They just don't like us. Why? If you understand about the spiritual world, okay, and I'm going to share with you why, as a believer, sometimes there is unprovoked uh, attacks or persecutions against you um, it's, it's not necessarily that you did something wrong, but uh, you, um, I'm going to share with you how you can understand this world, okay? So the, the, the Christians in Thessalonica were not going out of their way to cause trouble to people. And I hope you, you're not doing that, that you're not a troublemaker. You don't go around and stirring up things and gossiping and rumor and try to... to, to um, to uh, stir up uh, strife or dissensions among people, okay? I call that people, you know, who do that, they're tired of living, okay? They just like to cause trouble. Christians should not be part of that, all right? So you don't, you don't start rumors, you don't start gossip. Let it not come from your mouth. Even though you heard it, maybe just uh, don't even repeat it or don't even receive it in the beginning. Okay, so Proverbs 22.3 talks about a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hide, hide it himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So, as I mentioned, we ought not to just go out and we see evil and try to get involved in it and be a part of it. We should just go around it, like avoid it or, or not be concerned with it. So that's the best way. Just let it, in your life, just let it drop. Um, and, and sometimes things happen, evil is going to be passed around, but you don't have to be a part of it, okay? You're not of the world, you're, so you don't have to be a part of that. So if you see evil, um, just avoid it. Now, if, if it's a case of somebody needing your help, then um, you can be able to help them if they need help, right? But as Christians, let's avoid evil. Let's not be someone that always a part of it. And that's the wise person, okay? The prudent man. Paul, what Paul is referring to is this spiritual warfare that is going on. In Ephesians 6, 12, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Paul, who had his spirit eyes open, was able to see that just as in, 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 in God's kingdom, in heaven, there's hierarchies. And I haven't really figured out the hierarchy of the host of um, God's army. He has angels. God has angels. We know about the archangels. We know about cherubim, seraphims. We know about these angels. There's, there's some kind of hierarchy that God has established. Satan, who had lived in heaven himself, 
until he rebelled, right? And but he, he'll come back to to God. Some um, um, knows about this hierarchy, and he's an imitator. Okay, he's a counterfeit, but an imitator. He try. He also establishes his hierarchy of angels or evil spirits, these fallen angels, and he has a hierarchy. Just as a military has a hierarchy, just as a business company has a hierarchy, right? Um, Satan has this uh, demonic forces that he has established, and, and they're in this form. So when you read Ephesians 6.12, that is not just a random um, grouping of people. That's a hierarchy of the demonic uh, uh, forces in the kingdom of darkness. Too often, we will focus on people, right? We will, because we're looking in our natural eyes. Anytime you are in a group, and a group is probably like maybe two or three or more people, there's always bound to be conflict. There's always bound to be strife and all that. There's always bound to be somebody rubbing you the wrong way, right? When you look at people, you're going to get angry at them. You're going to, now it becomes personal, you and them and them and you or other people and other people. You're going to see a lot of strife and friction going on. As believers, know that you don't wrestle or strive with flesh and blood, with humans. But our battle, our war, is in the spirit world, okay? The spirit world. There's evil around us. And so if you can see that, then you will be able to maybe have patience with people that are causing you problems at, at, at your workplace, neighborhood, or wherever, even in your family. And, and you'll see that um, this is all uh, natural, but it, the, the origins are spiritual. If you can see that there's a spiritual battle going on, and that's why we see a lot of uh, strife uh, going on, and it's about people versus people, and even in the, the church many times, People get angry at one another. A spirit, uh, spiritual people, we should be looking in the spirit, all right? And Peter was uh, uh, one time used by, the, by Satan, remember? When, when Jesus says, I, the Son of Man has to um, be um, persecuted, then he will be, um, he will die, basically, and then on the third day we were raised, Peter rebu uh, rebuked Jesus, right? And he says, no, over my dead body. Well, I'm paraphrasing that. That's not going to happen. And then Jesus turned around and he says, Satan, get thee behind me. So Satan, uh, Peter was, the apostle Peter was used by Satan at one time, okay? And um, so Christians sometimes can be used by the enemy, to, to uh, cause friction around amongst each other. But we should be, be spiritual people. Above that, we shouldn't be fighting with one another, right? Know, know that evil originates from Satan and his demons. And so when we get into frictions with other Christians, when we get frictions with even our spouses, husband and wife, or, or with children, or the family of God, Let's stay in the spirit. Let's not just immediately react in the flesh. Flesh on flesh. Then you're wrestling now with flesh and blood. You're not wrestling with the spirit, spiritual things, okay? So this will help you in your relationships. Um, that we as Christians, we should be in unity. Because if you have the same Holy Spirit that I have, there should be unity in the body. If your, your, your family is, are all Christian, there should be unity in your family, right? You understand? Because there's one spirit, one faith, one baptism, and there's um, unity. So we, there should be unity, not strife. But if, if something, strife or divisions, arguments and all that come against each other, um, that's not from God, but that's probably from the flesh, 
but um, originating from the devil. So we got to be careful about fighting amongst each other. All right? And let's have unity in this body. Psalm 121.7. The psalmist writes, The Lord shall pre preserve thee from all evil. Somebody say, all evil. From all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So if the Lord is going to preserve, protect you, keep you from all evil, even though this is Old Testament, he'll do that even as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 3, he shall keep you from evil. Amen? God is going to protect you from evil. The people next to you are not your enemies. Amen? You got enough evil around this world. So we are few, and we should not be looking at other people as the enemy. They're not your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. Amen? You have enemies around this world, in this world, and there are a lot of them. And you waste your energy on fighting against people in your family and people in the family of God. They're not your enemies. Look at someone and say, you are not my enemy. Amen? Okay. But God will keep you from all evil. You know, I've heard sometimes um, uh, even like uh, families, spouses, they said, yeah, the, the devil is in her. What? That's your wife. The devil is not in her. Come on. The Lord shall keep you from all evil. So don't be uh, giving glory to the devil more than he needs to get the glory, okay? You guys give, you glorify him. Every time you say the devil is all over the place, right? He's not in your spouse, amen? He's not in your brother or sister next to you, amen? Okay, so we got to cut this, um, this, um, this uh, pseudo-religion about the devil being in everyone, okay? The devil is not like in everyone. The Holy Spirit is in every Christian, that's the truth. But not, the devil cannot be in everyone. But God will keep you from all evil. Amen? Let me give you some specific cases here. This is God's spiritual and supernatural protection. God the Father kept Jesus from evil. And let's look in Luke 4, 28. And all they in the synagogues, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Jesus was in the synagogue and... And we're going to assume that these people were Jewish, okay? Because they, they're in a synagogue. And these are the people that he grew up with. They saw Jesus as a, as a young child. And they, he, he grew up, he grew up amongst them. And at the age of 30 is when the Lord Jesus Christ was, was told by the Father to enter into the ministry. So he goes through the, the baptism at the River Jordan, the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, after then he goes into the 40 days, 40 nights of temptation. And shortly after, he comes to Jerusalem, okay? I mean, to Nazareth. And he, he shares the gospel in the synagogue where he grew up, I think. I think that's where he grew up, in that same synagogue. Anyway, and all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, this is after Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has given me, he anointed me to preach the gospel, and to, to heal the, the, the sick and right, set the captives free. And then they were filled with wrath. They're very angry now. And rose up and thrust him, Jesus, out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon the, their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. So what happens here? is that the people in the synagogue, and I suppose it was a small mob, or maybe a big mob, a large mob, are intent of taking Jesus up to the hill and throwing him headfirst to what? 
to kill him, okay? They're not there to, like, teach you a lesson, teach him a lesson. They're there to kill him. They're filled with this anger and wrath because now, because Jesus had proclaimed that he's God, right? When the, he said the Spirit of the Lord has anointed him, right? And also he shared some parables about them. But the people are angry. They're intent. There's a bunch of them. They want to kill him. But they go up to the hill, and Jesus, in a supernatural way, is able to walk right through the midst of the crowd, and they, they're not able to throw him over. Now, we can look at it in many ways. You can try to rationalize and say, well, maybe Jesus was jerking him out and, and, and trying to trying to move, and he was fast, and he could run away. No, he went right through the midst of them in a supernatural way. God had protected Jesus. Okay, this was not um, Jesus trying to, trying to move around and, and run away from that. He just walked right through him. He just went right through How can he do that when people are intent on killing him? Is the protection of God. God will keep you from all evil. There may be a time, and we shared Friday night, there's a lot of people are going through maybe like car kind of situations. Car is out of control. And God, and through midst of traffic that, that or, or, or oncoming traffic or traffic behind them, surely they could have got, uh, they should have been hit. There should have been some kind of accident. There should have been some kind of thing. But God preserved them in a supernatural way. And he will preserve you from all evil. Even though people might be intent or something that, that you think is inevitable, there's a supernatural aspect to this that God protected the Lord Jesus Christ from this evil that was about to happen. The next verse, if you were to read on, is that Jesus is going to share the gospel. He's going to go and share the gospel. What is the point about this? The reason why God has, um, has saved people, has protected them, is so that they can continue on with the sharing of the gospel. You understand? People are just so happy. Oh, okay, God saved my life, and I was protected and all that. And they go back right to the, to the normal thing. That's not, what, that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose, because Stephen was stoned. You know what happened to Stephen? He died. All right? But that left an impact upon Saul, who became the great, mighty apostle Paul. So there is a terminus. There's an end, end state on this earth for us here, okay? But in, in, in Jesus' case, at that time... Early on in his ministry, it was not his time yet so that he could continue to teach, preach, and heal. The reason why you are preserved, that God preserves you from evil, is so that you can continue on with the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because, okay, yeah, God loves you and he loves you and all that. That's fine. But I look at... Um, young, young uh, James, the Apostle James, he was martyred early on, right? You think he's too young to die, right? Why did he die? Well, you know, there's, there, there are purposes for that. But if God has preserved you from evil, even from death, it's not so that you can continue on with the life and just live a happy, normal life with your family, raise up your grandchildren. No, it's so that you can continue on the mission with God, for God. Amen? Here's another case here. In Jeremiah 36, 26. Uh, hang on, okay, because I, I got some difficult reading here. This is about Jeremiah the prophet, right? And uh, they're about to, to um, share the prophecy of God, and then uh, he does, and the reaction from the king and the princes and all these other people is negative, and they're hostile. They want, they want to... Uh, capture him and imprison him. If they if if they were really angry, maybe one they want to kill him. But the king commanded Jerah Jeremiel, the son of Hamalek, and Seraiah, the son of Azrael, 
and Shelemiah the son of Abdir to take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. Now note this, but the Lord hid them. But the Lord hid them. The Lord shall keep you from evil. What is important here to, uh, to understand is that it's the Lord who's hiding them. Now, I can go in more detail here, but Paul, after he uh, was blinded on the way to Damascus, and then Ananias prayed upon him, and his, the scales came out, and then Paul received the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul began to preach the gospel, okay? He went right out. He already knew the Old Testament. Now he saw the connection. Jesus is the Messiah. He began to share the gospel. He went out and he shared with the Jewish people first. And the Jewish people, some maybe received, but some of them were, were hostile towards Paul. And they wanted to kill Paul, okay? Um, they wanted to kill him. But Paul was in a place where there were other Christians. What they did was um, the, the man, whoever's house was, was alongside the wall. So they lured Paul outside of the window and in a basket and he was able to escape now this is not what this particular verse is talking about Paul basically escaped okay it's not the Lord hid him it's he escaped right through the help of man but in this particular scripture here in Jeremiah the Lord hid them okay so there's a supernatural case where God can hide you. And now, um, for you to understand is that, and probably some of you have never gone uh, to share the gospel in hostile areas. You read about it, pro prolific readers that you are, but you never did go out in a place where it's hostile. And there are times where in, the, in hostile locations, you meet hostile evil people that try to destroy the, the ones the, the missionaries that are going out there literally want to destroy them and kill them okay and the Lord will hide them okay unless it's their time that you know they become martyrs and all that but it's uh, and I've, I've experienced that we've experienced that and I'm not going to go into detail but the Lord hit us amen the Lord hit us the Lord will hide these people the Lord hid Baruch and Jeremiah and they were able to to continue on after that but it's the Lord doing something something supernatural it's not they escaping and thank oh God thank you we're able to escape that's not what this is, is saying somehow whatever it was whether the 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 Lord uh God had blinded the eyes of the people or something like that so they couldn't see him. Surely the king has authority and he can call all his soldiers and he can go find Jeremiah and Baruch. There's not many places they can go. God will hide you. He will keep you from all evil. And um, this has happened. I've seen this. I've experienced that where God will hide us. He will hide us from the people. Amen? And let me go to the last one here. Sometimes we might be attacked in all directions. Evil is all around us. Multi-pronged attack coming against us. Uh, we don't have a chance. But the Bible says in Psalm 91, 7, a thousand. Somebody say a thousand. Okay. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. In verse 9, because thou has made the, the, uh, the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. They shall no evil. Somebody say no evil. They shall no evil be befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Plague indicates sickness or disease, okay? For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in, thy hand, in their hands as thou shalt thou dash thy foot against a stone. Okay, so very quickly in the time that I have and I can talk a lot about angels, but I'm going to talk about briefly about angels. 
that God assigns angels around you. Now, how many angels? I suppose at least two, okay? So angels is plural. So English teachers, when you get an S, normally it means more than one, right? It doesn't mean one. It means more than one, correct? English teachers? Okay, thank you. Because we've got a bunch of Eng English teachers here. English is not my strongest language, okay? Nothing is. Okay, but anyway, um, angels. So at least two, amen? Look at somebody and say, at least two. So you have angels around you. How many of you have seen your angels? <laughs> so God assigned you angels to protect you, amen? Yes? And you don't even know your angels? You haven't seen them? It's because you've been moving in a natural spirit. Ask guys, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Not just sing the thing, okay, but pray. Because we're not going to find out the extent of the protection of the angels probably until we go to heaven, okay? There are times when angels will be revealed, even in this service, right? So if you got spirit eyes, you might see an angel around here. The angel is, is, is as, as one of these uh, famous uh, evangelists said, the angel of the Lord has a sword, right? And the, the, the sword was pointed towards that pastor, that evangelist. You know why? He was, he, was, he, was, he was very careful that this evangelist was speaking the word of God that is rightly divine, the word of truth. I'm not here to share fantasy with you. I'm not here to, to share a... Uh, a uh, spiritual kind of uh, uh, ecstatic kind of uh, story with you. This is according to the word of God. So I know that there have been times in my life, in my wife's time, because one time she was driving a car, and what, what could have been a serious accident, um, the sheet metal just came over her car, and it crashed into the car behind her, okay, and damaged that car, like broke the windows and everything. So it was, it was a serious threat, but I believe that there were angels that had protected her, okay. And just at that time, God, I was in a different place, about 200 kilometers, maybe in a place called Tegu. Anybody know Tegu? I was there on some kind of a training thing, and God had prompted me to pray at that exact time. I had no idea what was going on, but remember, what you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. You loose on earth, you loose in heaven. So my prayer, not because I'm good and smart and all that. I didn't know. I just, God just said pray. So sometimes if God tells you to pray, it might be for protection for your own family, right? So I'm going to end with this here. I'm going to end with this. In Matthew 6, 13, it says this. Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy. Okay. And along... Along with that is, and, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we pray, include in your prayer that God will protect you from evil. Okay? There are angels that can protect you. Don't pray the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus does not protect you. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from your sins. Okay? That's some kind of traditional prayer that some of you are raised up. That you say, plead the blood of Jesus over the, the car and the building. That's not scriptural, okay? That's not scriptural. But there are angels that protect you. The blood of Jesus is just to cleanse us from sins, to redeem us, all right? So understand that. You can ask God, God, that the, the angels will protect you, Holy Spirit will protect you, and he will keep you from all evil. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness, and Father, I pray that you would protect each one and the families that are represented, because we know not what the evil is up ahead. You do, but Father, we do pray, and we know that you are faithful. Thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.